Thank you. Time is up. We must now move on to questions to the Minister of Finance. I call Mr Roy Beggs. Sorry? Can I do a point of order? Uh, not during question time. For uh, the Minister? Uh, uh, no. Uh, qu points of order are not permitted during question time. Mr Beggs. Uh, Colonel uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, with your permission, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will answer questions one and three together. Uh, the guarantee for structural and investment fund projects signed prior to any change in relations with the EU applies to all projects approved under these funds. Uh, I have already placed a copy of the correspondence from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury in the Assembly Library in that regard. Uh, I visited Brussels last week where I continued to press the importance of EU funding and continued full engagement with the EU. I, I have, uh, as the member knows, and will continue to take all opportunities available to me to vigorously promote the interests of this jurisdiction within the EU. Mr Beggs. I think it is important that there is clarity, and, and can the Minister give it definitively once and for all, uh, whether the commitment by the Treasury that it would guarantee funding for structural and invest in investment fund projects signed before the UK leaves the EU, even where projects continue after the point where we have left, uh, applied to the York Street interchange, because there's been a lot of discussion about this, and does he agree, does he accept that there is a divergence between what he and the Infrastructure Minister have been saying and what the, the Treasury have said? Can he explain? Minister. Yes, um, but the member has to listen this time, so we're going to try again. You're right, absolutely, as my, as my answer said, uh, any letters of offer signed off before relations with the EU change will be honoured in full. Any letters of offer signed off after that, if such a thing could happen, are not going to be honoured in full. There are a number of programmes, including infrastructure programmes. Uh, we believe they won't even open until 2018. And it is possible, it is possible that letters of offer will not be signed or issued until after an exit from the EU. Uh, I, I'm very clear on that. I think uh, Mr Hammond is very clear on that as well, and I think ministers are. I call Michaela Boyle. Thank the minister for his uh, answer to the question. And can I ask the minister further what specific measures he has put in, in place, or he has uh, already, as he has already alluded to, uh, to protect funding streams here to ensure that funding streams to the north is protected? Gormaga. Minister. Well, well, as a minister responsible in particular for peace funding uh, and interreg funding, other ministers have responsibility for other, other packages and other streams of funding. Uh, I have made it my prior, prior, priority, as this House would expect, to try and protect uh, those uh, funding streams. Uh, I have tried to expedite the issuing of letters of offer, uh, taking due cognizance of the uh, need not to rush into arrangements which are, are less than the excellence we expect. Uh, in our letters of offer and, and in our projects. Uh, and last week, uh, as part of this work, I was very pleased to be able to report to our colleagues in the European Union that a, a letters of offer for €120 million Euro had been issued uh, in relation to Interreg and that the first letters of offer in relation to peace had been issued. Uh, there's a little way to go, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Some programmes have just opened recently. Uh, I'm reasonably confident that we will have issued all our letters of offer under Interreg and peace by the spring of next year. That brings us, by anyone's timeline, that brings us well within the period guaranteed uh, by the Chancellor. I also should say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that last week in uh, Brussels I had an opportunity to address the 27 other states uh, at a lunch as part of the General Affairs Council meeting uh, of the regions. I managed to address the 27 other ministers for Europe. I thought we had a sympathetic listen. Sympathy isn't really what we want. But I do think actions will follow and that there is a, an, awareness, an awareness within the European Union that the peace process is the crowning achievement of the European Union and they will take additional steps to make sure the peace process is protected uh, in the time ahead and that we do get uh, a special deal or special case or special recognition in the time ahead. I call Jim Allister. The Minister now reached the logical position that when we exit the EU, he cannot, nor can anyone, reasonably expect more from the Treasury than what the Chancellor has said, namely, 
that till that point, approved schemes are underwritten. But after that watershed, no such assurance can be given because there's nothing to assure. Minister. Well, well um, I, I disagree with the, uh, with the member because if he thinks about this, when we first went to the Chancellor and said, would you guarantee a piece of interreg funding? Some people thought, well, that, that can't happen. Uh, why would he guarantee funding after, at that stage, it was after uh, September? We actually secured that. Then we had a much more important victory where the Chancellor said he would guarantee all funding as long as it was signed off before an exit or relations with the EU changed. Uh, and, and I remain of the opinion that if we speak to the other 27 states, and our, our, our friend uh, Theresa May said yesterday that this could be a transitional uh, parting of the ways, it could, it could be not two years, it could be 15 years, for all anyone knows. Um, so let's put our best foot forward uh, in relation to cap payments after 2020, in relation to Erasmus, some of these other wonderful programmes that are, allow our young people to enjoy the bounty of Europe. Let's make the case for those programmes continuing. Let's make a case for the funding continuing as well. And I would be surprised if uh, any member here uh, would like the Minister of Finance to say uh, to, the British, to the British government, uh, don't go any farther in terms of guaranteeing EU revenue streams. I, I actually expect everyone here will uh, be, be disappointed if I don't go the extra mile and try to ensure that the funding we receive from Europe continues or is replaced in full. I call William Humphrey. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. If I return to the, the question about York Street interchange, if I may, and, and, and I know the Minister will have an interest in that, as I have as a, a Belfast representative. Given that the public inquiry has progressed, the um, proprietary work has started and the procurement is well advanced, will the Minister agree with me that this work essentially has begun on what is a crucial uh, infrastructure project for this city and for this region, connecting airports, ports and the two motorways in Belfast with the west of Northern Ireland? Minister. Um, as the member knows, I'm not the Minister for Infrastructure, but we find common ground and we both believe this is a priority project and we transform uh, the, the road infrastructure of Belfast. Uh, it is my, my view that we should be speaking to everyone who has influence over these matters uh, including the, the uh, European funds, infrastructure funds, which won't come on board on stream until 2018, but to the British government as well. It remains a priority. Uh, I think that the member and I are agreed on this. We need to and will deliver the York Street interchange. We move on. I call Mr Stephen Agnew. You, Mr Deputy Speaker, question number two, please. Minister. Um, uh, 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 th thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. Uh, as Mr. Agnew will be aware, in 2011, the then Finance Minister, Sammy Wilson, uh, made the decision to withdraw the scheme in relation to, to low carbon and zero carbon homes. Uh, I do, however, see merit in using the rating system in order to help increase and incentivize environmental sustainability. Uh, since taking up ministerial office, I have uh, asked my officials to undertake work on the feasibility of a more modern and tailored scheme. Uh, in this area. This work is currently ongoing within my department. Mr. Agnew. Mr. For his answer, and I think I'm looking again at this scheme. He'll probably not be surprised to hear that I'm not disappointed. Sammy Wilson is no longer the finance minister. Um, he suggested earlier in his statement um, that this uh, may be part of a package of measures. Um, how would he envisage uh, bringing that package forward? Is he proposed in primary legislation, or will it be done through regulations? Minister. Well, first of all, you can be sure of one thing, that you and I are, are uh, in, in the same, going in the same direction on this. I, I do believe it would be advantageous for us as a society to encourage low-carbon and zero-carbon homes, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the measures I take forward, whether primary or subordinate legislation, I suspect will be primary, uh, will be aimed at trying to encourage uh, homeowners and developers uh, to develop homes which would be compliant and eligible. Uh, for grant aid or for rates relief uh, or rate support in the time ahead. Um, we need now to get into the fine detail. We've done a fair bit of work. The landscape changed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, since this was originally introduced, which is why we couldn't just retrofit and just put it back in. Uh, but I'm pleased uh, with the briefing I've received so far from my officials, and if the member wishes, I'm happy to give him or ask my officials to give him an individual briefing. I know we'll have lots to say about this, lots of input. If you want to have that input early, I'm very happy to oblige that. 
I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I was going to ask the Minister whether or not he had raised with the Executive the financial savings in the long run from sustainable buildings, whether it's homes, offices, or public sector. But given the um, announcement today, perhaps could the Minister give us a, a quick update on the research and standards and the value for money that, that you spoke about in your statement today and what has already underway? Minister. Yeah, I mean, I, I could just say one thing about the entire construction industry. And you know, one of the best visits I have, I have done is had the pleasure to do as Minister was to visit the uh, Southwest College in Enniskillen, where they have absolutely uh, focused on this area of work, where they're skilling up young people to deliver uh, zero carbon homes, pass passive uh, energy homes. Uh, they have, I think, forged uh, a path unique in Ireland. Uh, and therefore, I do think if we want to be as, as, as really up at the, at the at the, the Champions League of, of, of European homes, which are car, car, low carbon or zero carbon, I think we need to uh, partner with business. Uh, we need to partner with the construction industry. And I think the, the, the value won't only therefore be in, in energy efficiency and tackling fuel poverty, but I think it'll also be in gearing us up for a set of skills, for a set of skills which will increasingly be in demand in the time ahead as we try and uh, increase uh, our delivery of buildings, which are which are carbon neutral or, or which, are, which are low carbon or zero carbon. Thank you. We move on. I call uh, Pam Cameron. Speaker, question number four. Um, uh, I thank the member for her question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I had a very constructive visit to the U.S. I met with a number of influential public finance and government representatives, including the New York State Controller, Tom DiNapoli. San Francisco Treasurer Jose Cisneros, the California State Controller Betty Lee, as well as the Chief Deputy Treasurer of California Colin Wong Martinson. Uh, I also addressed a, a meeting of tech leaders in the Airbnb building in San Francisco, which was convened by serial entrepreneur Seamus McAteer, uh, and at the request of InvestNI, I met a potential investor. Um, I view all these meetings as ongoing engagements. A number of avenues for continued cooperation and collaboration are being discussed and I'm hopefully reporting back to the Assembly in the time ahead on plans to deepen this process of engagement to our mutual benefit. Uh, during this trip, my officials, working with the assistance of InvestNI and the Bureau, uh, also held some very helpful meetings with various finance officials to consider what options might be progressed uh, to enhance external financing for companies and projects here. Supplementary, Mrs Cameron. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that uh, detail. Um, given the, the outcome of the recent election, does the Minister expect Northern Ireland to enjoy the same, and it's been quoted, unique and special relationship with the USA? Minister. Well, well yes, I do, and, and I think you'll, the member will find it interesting that the person who gave us a tour of the Airbnb building in San Francisco was a, a, a Belfast-born gentleman called Mark McCabe. Uh, we have friends right across the US uh, who are determined to ensure that the peace process uh, is transformed into a prosperity process. They are not only uh, right across every sector of society, whether it's arts, whether it's community, whether it's third sector, education, uh, but they're also in politics. And you will find that we have uh, political friends on both sides of the aisle. So while there has been, uh, I think, uh, traumatic change, some people will say are tumultuous change in the US in terms of politics, I think the constant will be that there is continued support for the peace and prosperity process here. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister confirm uh, whether his trip to America at the start of this month included any meetings, even in his own time, uh, to do with his personal interests as a director of Belfast Media Group Limited or with the Sinn Féin party? Thank you. Minister. Well, I'm here to speak as Minister, but I can, I can say this, that in the seven days I spent in the U.S., we did uh, enormously beneficial work to the community here. Um, as I travelled from coast to coast, I met a, uh, a gracious welcome, uh, people who are focused on the work ahead, uh, people who want to build rather than tear down, uh, people who want to accentuate the positive rather than focus on the negative. Uh, if you ever have the opportunity uh, to travel uh, representing this government, I think you'll find out that it is more arduous than you might uh, believe. So, therefore, while I did have uh, free time, I wasn't able on this occasion to use that free time to represent Sinn Féin or to take on any other responsibilities. I call Chris Little. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Finance Minister uh, if he gained any impression 
during his visit to the U.S. of what impact a uh, lack of access to the EU single market might have on uh, U.S. investment in Northern Ireland? Minister. Well, um, I was on uh, both coasts. Uh, I met uh, different audiences, uh, some Irish-American audiences, some uh, solely business audiences, such as the meeting we had in the Airbnb and then some of the businesses we met. Um, there wouldn't be anyone putting up their hand to say that we think this is a great idea that you're leaving the EU and leaving the single market. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it would be fair to say that uh, those who wish to uh, use us as uh, a base for investment see us as being a gateway to the EU. Uh, the member won't be surprised at that. It has been repeated many times by our friends on, on both, both coasts, and particularly those who have been working closely with us over recent years, some, some of them, of course, who you know. We move on. Uh, I call Mr. Trevor Clark. Uh, I thank uh, the member for his question. Uh, during the past three complete financial years, the running costs for the ministerial car were as follows: 2013-14, uh, 748 pounds; 2014-15, 1,406 pounds; 2015-16, 3,687 pounds. These costs include fuel, maintenance, and MOT-related expenses. Uh, the figures are subject to yearly variations depending on the minister in charge and the associated mileage and fuel usage. They are also dependent, of course, on whether the car is under warranty and subject to an agreement for servicing. Mr. Clark, supplementary. Um, can I thank the minister for the question? And from the outset, I mean I understand the need and the value of a ministerial car in terms of them doing their duty. However, I think maybe even in these figures, you haven't included the depreciation costs of the actual vehicles that are used. And I suppose I'm trying to draw a parallel here, Minister, and I raised a question with the Health Minister last week, and I'm wondering what you can do in terms of encouraging your own colleague about trying to, to fix the disparity for some of the nurses who work actually in the crisis team who are paid a, a measly 20 pence per mile for the use of their own private cars. Minister. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not responsible for the car fleet or for the policy, but if the member wants to bring forward any uh, amendments or, or, or alterations to the policy, I'm happy to consider them. I call Mr. Declan Kearney. Thanks, Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank you to Minister. Ara, Jogalad Kurshias, KV at Urunda, a mean the Homini Arakta, a Gobber de Grakak Shaktam. Could you explain to us, Minister, how many hours typically would your ministerial driver work each week? Minister. Well, well, he, he claims he's, he's overworked. Uh, that's the first thing. But I, I thank the member for his for his uh, question. Point of his over ditch. Well, Marta sogat tashi de clu or mahomani ker ebri jigri shake osko korinche urunta fathers jack ogos fishin lafakal and chatin shui heart ogos in ye. My driver has a reputation for hard work, uh, an early start, and long hours. Uh, I don't. Uh, he doesn't. He neither clocks in nor clocks out for me. But uh, it's not on typical, for example, last Thursday, where we started with a breakfast with the Chartered Accountants of Ireland in the Clayton Hotel in Belfast City Centre, and we ended uh, after meeting the Kilkeel Harbour Works folk at Annalong. Uh, it would be a 7.30 start for me and maybe 11 o'clock end. Uh, the car, of course, has to be uh, parked up and so on, and he, the driver would start earlier than me. So where I'm from, it's basically a 17-hour day. Yesterday would have been uh, quite similar and that we again started early with uh, a coffee at 8 o'clock and we weren't out of uh, this particular place then we had one more meeting and we were home around 10 o'clock and he's home later. So uh, I, I, when, I was, when I was Lord Mayor of this great city, I had the privilege of having three drivers um, who worked full out and did a great job. Uh, in my view, we have discovered the, uh, the three in one here and that my driver is performing the same job that three people performed. Thank the Minister for the diary of Martin Muller. Um, Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister. Can I, can I ask, and, and I don't envy anybody who has to drive you around with the schedule that we know you uh, keep. Can I ask, do, do, does the Minister's driver come from the pool of civil service drivers? And if not, why is that policy still in place? Minister. Well, no, no the, the driver doesn't come from the pool of uh, civil service drivers, but if you can find a, a superman or superwoman who wants to take on this job uh, within that pool, no doubt there would be some people who consider that. I think this. this uh, present system works very well. I think it delivers for the department. 
uh, it delivers for me. It has uh, been a system that's in place for, for some time now. And uh, while there has been uh, efforts to snipe at uh, the driver, who has a huge commitment to this institution, huge commitment to this department, a huge commitment to the minister, I think he's doing a very good job, and I think the system is a very good system. Move on uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Wigan. Uh, last Karen Collier. And uh, just can I thank the Minister for driving forward the economy here in the North? Uh, and can I ask uh, him what plans his department has to produce a citizen's budget? Well, uh, th thank, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thought you were going to congratulate me on driving on through these uh, questions. This is the first time I've managed to get to question number six. Uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, and raised to a citizen's budget. I am committed to open and transparent government, and I am convinced that the production of a citizen's budget would be a positive development for all of us. Uh, that is why I have asked my officials and the open government team to work with the open government network uh, to determine what a citizen's budget uh, might look like and to progress this work at pace to allow its publication to become standard practice over this mandate. Um, thanks to the Minister as well for his answers. Can I ask him then, just in following on from that, what steps are you taking to simplify uh, budget information? Um, well, interesting about the Open Data Network, people said, is, is that, uh, and maybe members won't be surprised at this, but the majority of people who pay rates or who pay tax or who are the, or the recipients of our services generally don't know where the money comes from or how it's allocated. Uh, and I think that to encourage not only compliance but to encourage engagement with our citizens. It would be helpful if we were able to publish, after this upcoming budget, for example, a, a summary, uh, hopefully on the web, but also in other formats as well, which lets people know how the money is, is divided up, lets them know the amount we raise on their behalf, uh, but also how the money is allocated between departments. And, and I do think that uh, sometimes the confusion uh, around uh, what taxation is paid and how it's delivered back into communities would be uh, not only clarified by such a system, but more than that, more than that, uh, we want people to be proud of the services they are delivered and understand how much we appreciate the contribution their taxes of all types make to the delivery of those services. Well, Mr. Smith, Philip Smith. Hey, Deputy Speaker, does the Minister accept that what the Executive got at present, uh, namely secret uh, monitoring rounds, no longer any public consultation on annual budgets, and absolutely no transparency how budget baselines are generated or altered is exactly the opposite of the thinking surrounding a citizen's budget. Minister. <coughs> thank you. Uh, I thank the member for, for his question. I'm going to um, ask him to get on the phone to, to Mr Hammond because if it wasn't for the, the dog's dinner and the mess uh, and the shambles of the British government, we would have had our budget uh, presented to this uh, House long before now. Unfortunately, due to those uh, difficulties in the crisis in London, uh, our ability to bring forward a three-year resource budget has been hampered. Uh, I do think, on the other hand, that we will uh, tonight, uh, well, I'll speak to the Chief Secretary tonight, we'll see the outworkings of the autumn statement tomorrow. We will move expeditiously to bring a budget uh, in front of, of the House, and I, I do believe I'll recall the House to do that before Christmas. And it's my hope that uh, we will have as long or longer than we had to review the budget last year. But as the British government settles, I would say, say to, to, to Philip, as the British government settles, uh, that will enable us to, to bring forward a budget system which, in fairness to some of my colleagues in, 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 uh, in other parties, in particular Ms Hanna, the SDLP, represent, let's simplify the entire process. There is a complicated budget, pro budget process. Let's simplify it internally, but also let's make sure our people uh, outside understand what is being delivered and how it's being delivered. I call Christopher Stalford. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I welcome what the Minister has said in terms of providing citizens with an itemised uh, receipt in terms of their rates and the other taxes that they pay. I've raised this issue with the Minister. Would the Minister also agree with me that it's important that people know and can see for themselves on a piece of paper precisely how the amount that they are billed in their rates is calculated in order that they get a full understanding of why, for example, in some areas their rates have gone up? by significant sums. Minister. Um, yes, I, I thank the member for his question. It's perhaps, perhaps that's becoming even a little bit more urgent uh, following the day in terms of, of business and domestic where we are making changes. 
And though we have uh, started that and had a stab at that and, and, and when we issue the rates bills, I think we're only starting and people need to have a clearer uh, view of where their money is going. But I just add this, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it was interesting to me when a deputation came here from the Basque country um, uh, last month, perhaps the month before now, um, and we met them in Uri, and one of the points they made was because they collect all their taxation, all their duty, all their taxation. They said that people really understand what they're getting for their money. Uh, they don't let the government away with anything, uh, but they have a great engagement with the, the government. And then, very importantly, compliance, the willingness to pay taxation, our rates, our property taxes, has increased. So uh, the member has brought this up before. I think he'll agree we've made a start, but we're nowhere near where I would like us to be in terms of people getting that rates bill and being able to say, this is what I am paying for in terms of council services for their bit, but also how their rates are making a contribution to the greater government budget. We move on. I call Catherine Seeley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what plans he has to increase the scale and effectiveness of capital investment? Question number seven. Thank you. Um, uh, th thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, uh, aside, aside from the real-term increases in our local capital budget, uh, I plan to utilise any additional capital funding which may be announced uh, tomorrow uh, as part of the Chancellor's autumn statement to take forward an economic stimulus package with the agreement of my uh, executive colleagues and with the agreement of this House, but I do think that's a good idea and we'll be bringing that forward. I also plan to ensure the executive uh, seek ways to introduce capital investment from other sources. Uh, that's why I've organised a symposium with uh, IBAC and the CBI on the 27th of January, which will give the construction and business sectors an opportunity to engage with government on investment opportunities and, of course, where the funding will come from. Uh, in addition, in terms of uh, how we spend our money, uh, I have recently appointed seven new external members to the procurement board from the private uh, and foundry and community sectors. Uh, this includes Colin Maxwell, who uh, is an artist and an architect, and I have tasked him with bringing forward proposals to promote architectural excellence uh, and to further the arts and the executive infrastructure projects. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. In fact, he has touched on it a little in my supplementary, but um, given that he does have a keen interest in the arts, can I ask the Minister how he intends to use capital inve investment to further support the arts? Thank you. Well, it, it's, it, it's commonplace uh, south of the border. Uh, Cork, Cork City, in particular, has recently uh, published an evaluation of how they use percent for arts. It's uh, common in parts of Europe. Uh, it's certainly very common in San Francisco and New York uh, that when you are when you're undertaking a capital project that you do set aside a percent uh, for the arts. I think the consequence of that is that you really change the entire cityscape or landscape of cities. Uh, and it would be my wish that we could uh, reinvestigate uh, high percent for art, which we have stopped, which did exist, which we have stopped uh, for many years now, how we might bring that back into the centre of the procurement process, into the centre of the building process. So when you go to many great cities across Europe, and certainly many great cities across the US, where you do, do see new investment uh, in capital build, you also see new works of public art. And I think that's a, that's a, a good way to go, and I hope to be able to bring forward more ideas in that to this House. I call Emma Little Guinea for a quick supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I've been speaking to some people, Minister, about some very exciting proposals around capital investment. And given that we are anticipating a four year, multi year budget tomorrow in the statement from the Chancellor, um, can the Minister outline the time frame for the much needed investment fund? Minister. Well, we're, we're, we're doing better than we were when I think the member or one of our colleagues last brought this up because you know we did have some disappointing news from the European Investment Bank who thought it wasn't prudent for them to proceed along the lines we had originally uh, envisaged with the NI Investment Fund, which was first put forward by your colleague, Minister Hamilton. Uh, but we're now making, I think, significant progress. I do hope we will get the OK from the Office for National Statistics that we can move this investment fund off balance sheet, which means we could deliver it in the middle of next year. And as she, as the member, as the chairwoman's very aware, there are a lot of uh, private sector people out there, energy projects in particular, who really do hope we get this investment fund up and running because they, they will be at our door asking to borrow money to really uh, make transformative investments in the community. Order. Uh, that ends the period of listed questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Alex Hadwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I remind the Minister that on the 8th of November he said, quote, I and my party wish to see a stepping up 
of the pace of transfer of powers to local councils. Unquote. Um, if we were to learn in the next short while that uh, urban regeneration and community development plan uh, powers were not to be transferred to councils, would you agree that that would be a big blow to those councils who were seeking those powers, those councils to again quote you on the 8th November, who are as bold as possible in their uh, vision and plans for the future? I remind the member it should be a topical question, not a typical question. Uh, <laughs> <ma> Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Well, ac actually, um, having met the 11 councils, um, I don't see any of them with heads down. Uh, I don't see any of them that are not uh, willing to embrace the new opportunities that come to them by being larger councils. Uh, I have no doubt, and I've, I've been in communication with uh, some of the chief executives who he will know as well, uh, I have no doubt that you will see in the time ahead a stepping up, a, a, a considerable ramping up of activities by councils in terms of uh, being masters of their own destiny and in terms of leading the charge for investment in their boroughs and in their cities. Mr Adwood, supplementary. Um, larger council needs larger powers. That's part of the deal in terms of the reorganisation of local government. But would you agree, Minister, that if it is the case that uh, development powers are not transferred, we have today government pulling in two directions, you appearing and I think trying to help the High Street and another minister, it might be, trying to impede the development of the High Street? Minister. Well, it's funny. I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think I would reduce councils just to the High Street. I mean, I, I did hear one of the very senior people on, on Belfast City Council uh, talk uh, this week about projects which are, uh, as, he, as he would acknowledge, are uh, as, as important, as pioneering, as transformative as any in the, on the island of Ireland. And uh, as I engage with not only the CEOs, I've also made it my business to engage with the mayors and the chairs, and they come from all parties. And I don't know if the member has seen this, but I do know that, that, that you know, he knows I met his, his brother, who's a councillor in Belfast, at one of the gatherings in Lisburn. And I sense a change of direction. A, I, I sense a greater ambition. Uh, I, I sense Yes, absolutely. Some of the councillors are disappointed that they aren't getting all the powers they want. But I don't agree with the, the uh, member that this, therefore, will negate or hold back the ambition and the boldness that I see. That I see. And I hope uh, in the budget, I hope to bring forward some measures which will be focused on councils as full partners. And as they step up, we will step up with them. And I understand, and I, you know, I deal, and he deals in particular with Belfast City Council, and I understand some disappointment in these matters, but uh, tonight, tonight I am attending a meeting uh, which involves Belfast City Council about investment in the city centre. Uh, I do hope before Christmas to engage again with Lisburn Castle Ray around investment. I have been contacted by the Middlestar Council, and, and he will know that just last week I, had, I was at a dinner in, uh, in Derry, attended by John Kelpie, the CEO of the Derry uh, and Strabane Council. So, uh, I, I, I think we should all take our inspiration and take heart uh, from the attitude of councils. They're not getting everything they want. Some of the councils aren't getting everything they want. But there's no way there's any less than enough pace, and I intend to match that pace in the time ahead. I call Mr. Marvin Story. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and uh, thank him, the Minister for the answers he's given to the House. In terms of going back to his statement earlier on today in relation to rates, the Minister may be aware that the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy's conclusion in relation to the review of the business rates was not supported by the evidence of, that was gathered from some 500 businesses. And they actually argued for the retention of the scheme and actually against any attempt to restrict it. Do, does the minister take into account, in light of the statement today, those concerns that those particular businesses expressed in that particular survey? Minister. I, I do, and I think we have to uh, move forward together on these matters. Um, uh, he knows that not every uh, business organisation, not every business is supportive of the direction in which I am, uh, uh, I, I am moving. Uh, we can't ride roughshod over people. Uh, but I also would ask the member to bear in mind that we do need to do something different that uh, we did introduce a, a set of emergency, if you wish, business relief. Uh, for small business in 2010, and that was, it. That was a time of terrible economic crisis. Uh, I'm not underestimating the challenges which face business today, but I do think we've made progress. 
And, and I will be trying to take as many people as possible. Uh, I don't, uh, as, as the member will be aware, uh, I don't think for a minute that I have all the answers. I do think there will be tweaking of these proposals as they uh, come forward. The only thing I would say to the member is let's not water down the proposals so we end up with something that doesn't make an impact. So if he can give me that uh, assurance, then I can assure him, uh, as, as of course I must, that I will be consulting with all my colleagues on the best way forward. Story supplementary. Thank the Minister for the reply. Will he, will he give an assurance in terms of uh, the small businesses and particular retail sector in my own town of Ballymoney and places like Ballycastle and Ballymena in my Northampton constituency that there are those that are deemed as retail that won't be outside his definition of what retail is so that other uh, sectors may benefit at their expense and hence their rates might increase and that obviously will be something which will be of grave concern. Minister. Well, I think I am visiting your constituency either before or after Christmas to meet business people, and no doubt this will be high on the agenda. I have not actually uh, stated one definition or one definitive definition of what uh, retail is, and there are areas, for example, hairdressers, which seem to me is, is a service, uh, is, is very close to retail. Uh, but there are other things like payday lenders, there are other uh, uh, there are other matters, and I have to apologise to my many friends who are accountants and solicitors. There are other people who occupy offices. They do bring footfall to the town centre. They have enjoyed business relief for seven years, uh, but I think now we need to move. We need to focus on the, on the uh, hospitality sector and the small retail. And I hope we do it in a way that we join up with the, with the council, for example. We join up, if there's a business improvement district, we join up with the business organisations to try and get extra uh, power behind this push that we're not standing alone uh, in relation to these matters and in terms of this proposal, because it will not work. Uh, none of this will work if it is to be seen in isolation. It really needs uh, all those who have the, the, the goodwill, who have the interest of the uh, high street and town centres at heart, needs them to work together. So the, the member can be assured that I will be working very closely with those he represents, but he can also be assured I am uh, convinced that, that we have to do things differently and that this will get a, a bigger bang for our buck. I call Mr. Trevor Lunn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, given his position as guardian of the public purse, uh, could he give us his assessment of whether he thinks there's any waste or inefficiency or dead weight in the administration of the Social Investment Fund? Minister. Um, it, it, would, it wouldn't be question time if, if somehow or other the Alliance Party didn't get the Social Investment Fund into, into uh, every question. Um, I, I, I am not. The, uh, either the first or deputy first minister, he'll be pleased to note. Uh, I think, in fact, and, and I can't think of a programme of a government or an area of government which couldn't become more efficient. Uh, but at the same time, I do think we should all acknowledge that there have been Trojan efforts made in recent times, in particular, to try and deliver services more efficiently uh, and, uh, and at the same time do it in a way which saves money to the public purse. Uh, what I would say is he can, he can, he can take it to my commitment as 100 per cent to make sure that every penny of uh, public money we have that we guard it zealously and that we make sure that when it's spent, it's spent properly, uh, it's spent in a way which is benefit to the public and that, that uh, those who do pay taxation, we've talked a lot about that today, that if their taxes are to be used and turned around, that they can be assured that we're doing everything to make sure they get a full return on, I suppose, what is their investment. Mr. Lund. Yes, I, I'm quite encouraged by the Minister's answer, but on the back of that, does, does he think that GEMS, and his, who have done a lot of work in his own constituency on employability, really need the services of an organisation like Charter NI to provide management services, given that they have provided much larger contracts without that requirement in the past? Minister. Well, you would be moving me too far into another department. Uh, I, I will take the opportunity to, to commend the work of GEMS. He, he and I have both known their work over, over many years. Uh, I think they are diligent. I think they have a, an eye to uh, the public purse. I think they are really uh, concerned to make sure they make a difference in people's lives. And uh, where, where they stand and where they deliver work, and I don't know if they're, they're in your constituency in Lisbon, but they are in my constituency, I think they make a real difference. So uh, I reiterate my earlier, earlier comments, which, which I know he will agree with, that if we, all of us, all of us are guardians of the public purse, I have an additional obligation. I'm going to make sure that that obligation is, is, uh, is carried out to the full. I call on Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Finance Minister, as part of the rates reform announcement today, 
proposed uh, business empowerment zone pilots, one of which uh, would be in my own constituency of East Belfast, from the Newton Arch Road to Hollywood Arches. I declared interest as a, a long-term tenant of Hollywood Arches. Um, and I ask the Minister, does he recognise the key role that the entire Hollywood Arches triangle from the Newton Arch Road to Grampian Avenue has to play in the key regeneration channel challenge of the Newton Arch Road? Well, I welcome the, the, the member's comments, and, and I know it's only today that he's had a chance to, to mull over this idea, and we will have a, a, a greater opportunity in a time ahead to, to return to it, especially with the MLAs for, for West and East. It is a pilot. Uh, if, it, if it works, it would be great if we could have a rural, rural pilot as well after that. Uh, I haven't, as you note, when I said this morning, uh, this is where I think the likely boundaries will be. It would be unfair of me to say it will definitely be start here and end there. That's why I said likely to be. But the LPS has done some work in that area uh, and calculated that the investment by this government in that pilot uh, zone, in that business empowerment zone area, would be about a million pounds. Uh, that is to boost businesses already there, to ensure they invest more, but also to attract new investment. If the member, uh, as we debate this and discuss this, and we'll do it, of course, with the other stakeholders in the area, if he thinks that it can be tweaked a little bit to bring in uh, another slice of the, the Newton Arts Road, then I think we should bring that forward. I don't think we should, I don't think we should be too definitive, uh, although I, I, I would also urge caution that we don't end up uh, going down lots of byways and highways as well. Mr Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the, the Minister for his response. And I asked the Minister would he undertake to meet with Hollywood Arches uh, businesses and myself to ensure that they are fully included in this uh, proposal? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, maybe if I could su uh, suggest as well that uh, while we have consulted with different uh, stakeholder groups around these proposals and we talking to people today, uh, I think we need a wider meeting in East Belfast because this is an opportunity. Uh, this opportunity needs to be seized. If, if we do nothing but implement this business empowerment zone uh, rate support, rate relief in isolation, it will not work. It takes the MLAs, it takes the department, especially the Department of Communities, uh, it takes the business organisations, it takes Belfast City Council to get behind the idea. But of course, as he knows, I have an open door policy and I'd be very, welcome to, I'd be very happy to welcome him and his constituents in to see me. Thank you. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, can you assure the House that when you're consulting on the um, ch potential changes to rates for charity shops, that you will meet with the likes of the hospices who provide beds for children at the late, last stage of their lives? They are very reliant on the income from shops and other sponsorship and funding um, efforts, and uh, there is an increasing gap between the amount they get from government and the amount they have to raise. And I just want to put a record, I'm very concerned about the implications for frontline services from this um, policy today. Well, I meet the uh, uh, Northern Ireland hospice folk often. Uh, they know of my strong support uh, for their efforts. Uh, they know of that personal support, and they know of that support as a minister. Uh, but they also know uh, my view that it would be important that everyone who occupies a high street shop uh, should make some contribution towards the rates. Uh, I also believe that if it does turn out to be 10 percent, it's 20 percent in England, Scotland, Wales, it will be about 15 pounds a week. Uh, I don't believe that there's any charity out there which couldn't uh, go to its landlord. Its landlord, and many of these landlords are making a fortune because they negotiated with charities which didn't have the noose or, 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 or the cutes to understand what they were signing up for. I'm not saying that's the case of Northern Ireland Hospice. Uh, but they could certainly go to their landlord and say they should take uh, some, some, some of the pain on this. Uh, so I wouldn't see this in any way as being a, a, a threat to the charities. But in fact, uh, in my discussions with charities, some, some of them are much larger than others, of course. Uh, some of them are very well resourced, of course. Uh, in my discussion, what I've said is, could we not look at ways of ring fencing this money to work on uh, entrepreneurship in the social sector? And I meet. In all these hubs around Belfast, I meet startups, small businesses, entrepreneurs who are focused on, the, uh, on social enterprises. So there is actually an opportunity for us to, to find new ways, additional ways to raise revenue. So I would say to the member, uh, don't be overly concerned. But uh, if, if, uh, if, she, if, if she wants to share those concerns, she should do so in the time ahead. But um, I, I will certainly be maintaining the very warm and close contact I have with the NI Hospice in the time ahead. 
Thank you. Time is up um, uh, for the end of question time.